Hey guys, Chastity here to break down episode nine of Star Trek Picard. Warning, there are spoilers ahead. Now let's jump in. Full disclosure, the GameSpot staff is working from home as our office is closed, so you won't see us on camera for this breakdown. For now, let's dive into the plot for Episode 9. We start right where we left off in Episode 8, with La Serena traveling through a transwarp conduit on its way to Soji's homeworld. Vessels entering a transwarp conduit experience extreme temporal stresses and turbulence, and use a chroniton field to maintain temporal synchronization. La Serena's computer states its use of a chroniton field as it moves through the transwarp conduit. Chroniton field integrity at 90% and holding. Because of Transwarp, they're able to travel 25 light years in 15 minutes. The crew reach their destination, the planet Capelius. Note that they didn't go to Deep Space 12 to rendezvous with the squadron from Starfleet. I, am I still under arrest? It was a change of plan. Soon after their arrival, Narek's ship appears and both ships engage in a firefight. As Narek powers up his disruptor cannons, suddenly the Borg artifact cube appears from the transwarp conduit, looking almost nearly regenerated. From the planet's surface comes five giant orchids. One wraps itself around La Serena as the four others tend to the Borg cube. The power goes out of La Serena as the orchid pulls it towards the planet's surface, and during the turbulence, Picard passes out. Thank you for coming. Next, we get a montage of the events leading up to Picard's journey, as Picard reflects subconsciously on Chateau Picard, speaking with his doctor, and setting out on his mission. He soon awakens in sick bay with Agnes checking in on him. Agnes is using an old-school medical tricorder to perform a scan on Picard. Now, medical tricorders have appeared on Star Trek dating back to the original series. Usually, they were the first tool a Starfleet doctor used to assess a patient's condition. There's something wrong. I don't know. It, uh... Might just be a tricorder showing its age. Agnes thought Picard had a head injury but couldn't find signs of trauma. From her behavior, we can tell the tricorder revealed to Agnes that something is wrong with him. And we already learned from his doctor in episode 2 that Picard is dying, due to the abnormality in his parietal lobe. Next, Picard gathers the crew and says they're going to return Soji to her people, and tell them that a Romulan force is on its way to kill them. He then tells them about his brain abnormality and that the prognosis is terminal, and there is no treatment for it. This news hits the team hard, but Picard does not want to discuss it. Anyone who treats me like a dying man will run the risk of pissing me off. Rio says La Serena is structurally intact, but the Orchid knocked its power and systems offline. Rafi says Capelius is a Class M planet smaller and denser than Earth. Before going offline, she noticed a small settlement, which Soji identifies as Capelius Station. Soji believes she was born there, but she wasn't there long. Rafi estimates that the Romulans are only a day or two behind their pursuit. The crew move out on foot, but before they can go to the station, Picard wants to stop by the crashed artifact cube to look for Elnor and Hugh. They find a group of surviving XBs with Elnor and Seven of Nine. So are you here to help with the cleanup, or do you just make messes? I don't believe it. Seven tells Picard about her experience connecting herself to the artifact, and that in doing so, she was connected to and saw everything for a few minutes. She was even able to see La Serena and the Snakehead chasing it. We learn that Seven had opened another conduit and came through it to help them. Picard laments about Hugh's death, then asks Seven for long-range scanners. Rafi gets the artifact scanners working and detects 218 warbirds headed for them. Picard once again says goodbye to Elnor, who offers to protect him. Picard insists that the XBs need his help more than he does. Elnor is afraid that he'll never see him again, and Picard tells him he's proud of him, and Seven wishes him well. Keep saving the galaxy, Picard. That's all on you now. Next, the crew reaches Coppelia Station, where they encounter a set of twin synthetics. One with gold eyes named Arcana approaches Soji and says that they've missed her. Soji knows her name and is happy to be home. Arcana recognizes Picard as Captain Jean-Luc Picard and calls him Data's captain. Soji tells the synthetics that a fleet of Romulan warbirds is coming to destroy them. Arcana says they only have ten orchids left. Then, Dr. Alton Soong approaches them, played by Brent Spiner. Alton is the son of Noonien Soong, who lives on Coppelius with the synthetics. Welcome home, my dear. Well, we better hear the whole story. Come with me, please. Next, Soji blames herself for everything. She thinks she let the Romulans write to them, but soon quickly tells her that it wasn't her fault. He called Maddox's plan with Soji and Dodge deceptive and devious. He blamed the synth band for Bruce's actions, and it seems clear that Soon knows way more than he's letting on. Next, we meet Soji's sister Sutra, who looks a lot more like the original Soon like androids were accustomed to on Trek. Sutra proceeds to grill Agnes on her decision to kill Bruce Maddox, and she wants to know more about the Romulan admonition. She believes the admonition is actually intended for synthetic minds and not organic, and she intends to find out by attempting a mind meld with Agnes. Somehow it works, and Sutra learns that the admonition is a call to arms by an alliance of synthetic life. 
The admonition promises to protect synthetic life and wipe out organic life if called upon. Your evolution will be their extinction. In Alton Soong's lab, Agnes learns that Soong is working on mind transfer. This leads her to tell Rios that she wants to stay behind to work on Maddox's unfinished work. Rios quickly tells her to be careful because he doesn't trust Soong or anyone else from the planet. They share a heartfelt moment before Rios leaves. Meanwhile, Sutra and Soji are in a big disagreement on what their next moves will be as the Romulans are quickly approaching. Soji wants to get everyone off the planet while Sutra wants to go along with the admonition's promise. And before they can continue the conversation, Narek has been captured and jailed. I said I'll come with you. Next, Rafi is heading out to work on La Serena and gives her goodbyes to Picard. She tells him thanks for everything he's done and she loves him, which Picard replies, I love you too, Rafi. <sighs> Later on, Picard attempts to send a secure message to Starfleet Command that he's made first contact and requests to establish diplomatic negotiations to protect the inhabitants of the planet from the incoming Romulan attack. Meanwhile, Narek nearly escapes his cell before Soji puts a stop to it. The two get into a heated exchange that ends with Soji proclaiming that the Romulans won't be successful with their attack. Back in Bruce Maddox's old quarters, Soji is having conflicting views and talks to Picard about the logic of sacrifice. The logic of sacrifice? Hmm. I don't like the sound of that. Meanwhile, Sutra relieves Saga from her security duties and speaks to Narek privately. This leads to Narek's orchestrated escape by Sutra and the death of Saga. Soji regrets not killing him and we see Narek racing towards the artifact. Sutra quickly begins the next part of her plan by telling Picard she's going to transmit a beacon to the synthetic beings that made the admonition. Obviously, Picard thinks this is a terrible idea and says that they're living up to the Romulan prophecy and becoming the destroyer after all. Picard makes one last plea to everyone and says that he'll become an advocate on their behalf, also claiming that he'll put an end to the synth ban. Soong tells Picard the plan won't work because the Federation didn't listen to him after the attack on Mars and he doubts they'll listen to him now. So they put Picard on house arrest with Soji's approval. Agnes is able to talk her way out of confinement by requesting to help Soong with his mind transfer research. The episode ends with Picard sent off while the Romulans led by Commodore O are a day away from landfall. Now onto things we noticed and Easter eggs. Seconds after La Serena exits the Borg transwarp conduit, things get a little heated, with Narek's snakehead ship showing up and attacking it. When it does, we hear the familiar red alert alarm ringing throughout the ship, although it's been updated since The Next Generation and Voyager. Red alert. All hands stand to battle stations. The orchids are a running theme with Bruce Maddox and his synth creations, and it turns out they're not just metaphors for mixing synthetic and organic life, or for Soji and Dodge's creation. Giant spacefaring orchids allow the synths to defend themselves against incoming ships. That's fascinating and weird and raises the question of what else the synths are using the flowers to do. Agnes mentions being surprised when Rios lowers La Serena's shutters, revealing the ship's windows. Though the bridges of Star Trek starships usually use view screens that can display communications and different camera angles outside the ship, there are also windows and portholes scattered around as well. They might look like they're made of glass, but those windows are actually transparent aluminum, as covered in Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. Transparent aluminum? That's the ticket, laddie. We first heard about Picard's impending neurological troubles back in episode 2. He's got an abnormality in his parietal lobe, which was actually first mentioned way back in the series finale of TNG. Back then, Dr. Beverly Crusher suggested that Picard might develop any of a number of neurological disorders or none at all. Now we know that this issue will eventually kill John Luke, but he's basically ignoring it. The fact that this disorder has come up again this late in season 1 suggests it might start having an effect on his ability to lead before much longer. Rafi? Class M planet? Star Trek fans have been hearing about Class M planets for decades across all the franchise's series. Class M is the Federation and Starfleet designation for planets that can support human life. Essentially the places where it's safe to send away teams, land, and walk around. As a Klingon warrior and chief of security on Enterprise-D, we often saw Worf working to keep his combat skills sharp. One way he did that was with the Klingon martial art Makbra, something that he often taught classes for other members of the crew. It looks like the synthetics are also a fan, which would make sense if they all share some of Data's influences from his time aboard the Enterprise. We saw the Romulan fleet go to warp and leave the artifact after Seven of Nine freed it from Romulan control. Though Romulus might have been destroyed, the Tal Shiar and Jatvash still have a lot of power at their disposal, it seems. It's also worth noting that though they're called Warbirds, these are a new version of the main Romulan warships we saw in The Next Generation, which in turn were updated versions of the ones that appeared in the original series. 
Over the years, we've seen a few members of the lineage of Noonien Soon, the cyberneticist who created Data, and all played by Brent Spiner who portrayed Data. On Star Trek Enterprise, we met Soon's great-grandfather, Eric Soon, a geneticist who believes in genetic engineering of the type that created superhumans like Khan, the villain of Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan. Data, Lore, and B4 were obviously his direct creations, and therefore kind of like his children. Now we find out that Noonien Soon had a biological son, Alton, as well as artificial ones. Again, played by Spiner, Alton has followed in his father's footsteps, although he seems more like Eric than Noonien in his dedication to his creations at the expense of other humans like himself. In trying to get the information about the admonition out of Agnes's brain, the Synths and Alton turn to the idea of another Vulcan mind meld. Alton says that Sutra has an interest in Vulcan culture, noting that she's read Surak. She's read Surak, she plays the Garthira beautifully. That's the famous Vulcan philosopher who first pushed Vulcans to suppress their emotions, which had brought the Vulcan people to the brink of extinction in favor of pure logic. You can even spot a Surak book in Rios' quarters in the last episode. After seeing the admonition, Sutra even responds with one of Mr. Spock's famous phrases phrases, fascinating, which was also something Data was fond of saying as well. Fascinating. It seems Alton Soon didn't just help Bruce Maddox to make synthetic humanoids. He also was able to make synthetic animals and insects, including butterflies and cats. We meet Spot 2 while Picard and his crew are hanging around the synthetic's home, a nod to Data's pet cat, Spot, who he cared for while he was a member of the Enterprise crew. Alright, that's it for episode 9, so let us know what you thought about the episode in the comments below. Greg and I will be back on camera next week. See you next time.